Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Hugh. I'm, I'm very honored and delighted to be here, and um, hope that you all will find this uh, an interesting, an interesting account. I assume you all chose this over playing volleyball out there, and uh, because you have some interest in autos or Washington or what we did, or hopefully all of the above. What I thought I would do is to um, talk for half an hour or so, and then uh, open this up to questions and comments and things like that. And I thought I would divide what, um, <clears throat> what I do into kind of three parts. Um, I thought I might start by just reading you a couple of pages from the beginning of the book that will give you a, hopefully a little bit of a feeling for what it was like to be there and to sort of take on this job and, and some of the feelings that we had as we were trying to do it. And then um, I'll, I'll, I'll sketch briefly a chronology of what we did, just to remind all of you or inform you if you weren't um, paying as much attention. And then I'd like to close by giving you sort of five or six takeaways or thoughts that are kind of what I would view as the lessons learned from this. As Hugh said, this was the uh, largest uh, intervention by the government in the industrial sector in history. It was therefore without precedent as to size and complexity. Uh, there were many public policy and industrial issues that arose around the question of whether to help autos and if we helped autos, how to help autos management issues, finance issues, um, and as I said, industrial policy issues, political issues. And so it was a, it was a fascinating time for me. I was really um, flattered to be asked to serve, and uh, even though I was not an auto guy, um, and, uh, and really wrote this book to try to share the story of what we did and to tell the story uh, the way at least I saw it, and I think most of my team members saw it, so that uh, amidst all the kind of criticism and second guessing and things that have gone on about this as well as many other policies of the president, people would at least have my version uh, of what we did as best I could, uh, as best I could tell it. So this opening scene is, uh, is, is from March uh, 25th of 2009. It was right before the president's first speech on autos on March 30th and we had uh, uh, actually, it was actually March 29th, excuse me, uh, right before the president's speech on March 30th, and we had gathered to um, be there for the president as he made the first series of calls around to important constituents to tell them what he was going to be telling the country uh, the next day in, in a speech that obviously got uh, banner headlines and was a, a, huge, uh, a huge event in the uh, economic life of the country. The Oval Office has no proper waiting room, only a small anteroom in which President Obama's body person, Reggie Love, and his secretary, Katie Johnson, are usually seated. Against the wall is a small TV normally used to monitor news channels. But on this Sunday evening near the end of March 2009, it was tuned to the Arnold Palmer Inv Invitational Golf Tournament, where Tiger Woods, then still heroic, was making a long-awaited return from knee surgery. A few minutes before 7.30, a handful of us from the President's Auto Industry Task Force had followed Chief Economic Advisor Larry Summers down a narrow flight of red carpeted stairs and along a short corridor to this room. We'd spent the past hour in the rabbit warren of offices on the second floor of the West Wing, reviewing once more the key documents for a nationally televised announcement President Obama was to make the next day, the 70th of his presidency. For Obama, this would be among his first major public actions. For our little task force, it was the point of no return. Since the task force's hasty formation in February, we had been meeting with General Motors and Chrysler, both of which were being fed intravenously with taxpayers' cash. Dozens of consultants, investment bankers, and other outside experts had presented their views, and the question of what the government should do with the struggling automakers had been debated extensively up the administration chain of command. Finally, intense meetings at the White House a few days before the President had made his decisions. Those decisions had remained secret until now. Tonight, he would call the Michigan lawmakers to alert them to what he was planning to say the next day. The president hadn't come downstairs from his living quarters yet, giving us a few minutes to root for Tiger's comeback. For me, a welcome distraction from worrying about whether our plans for the largest government intervention in industrial America since World War II could work. We had had only five frenzied weeks to prepare for this moment. One more time, I mentally reviewed those plans, which included additional billions in taxpayer funding for General Motors and Chrysler, and several other controversial and risky measures. What could go wrong, I'd ask myself over and over. As a prime mixer of the strong medicine that the President was about to administer, I was sure that if disaster ensued, all eyes would be on me. 
In particular, I worried about the much discussed prospect of putting the automakers into controlled bankruptcy, a radical approach that defied conventional wisdom. While the President's speech the next day would leave open the possibility that bankruptcies might be avoided, I knew that the mere mention of it, let alone actually taking the step, risked imploding the auto companies, crippling thousands of related businesses, vaporizing millions of jobs, and intensifying what was already a deep recession across the Midwest. With America in the midst of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, this was no hyperbole. The failure of the auto companies could endanger the economy in ways that were almost too frightening to contemplate. The President arrived a few minutes late. Tiger was playing a particularly crucial hole, dressed in khakis and a black zipper jacket. I was not surprised that he was wearing casual clothes. I had on khakis myself. Since President Obama's arrival in the White House, shirt sleeves had become the Oval Office norm. And on weekends, almost anything went, even t-shirts and jeans worn by unshaven, sockless men. While his dress was informal, the President's mood was resolute. He had the air of a ma man in the business of calmly executing his decisions, not second-guessing them. After he chatted briefly with Reggie about the golf match, we followed him into the Oval Office, where he sat behind his desk, bare but for a folder of talking points for his calls. Katie dialed him first into a conference line on which four law lawmakers awaited, Michigan's two senators and two of its congressmen. Delegations from our task force had been meeting regularly with them, tense, often testy sessions in which we were lectured about the importance of helping this critical industry. We clustered around a phone uh, across the room from the president's desk by the armchair in front of the fireplace where he sat during meetings. Katie had activated the phone speaker so we would all be able to listen in, but it barely functioned probably installed by a well-connected government contractor, the President joked. He worked through his talking points, fluidly detailing the next day's announcements. Then he paused to let the legislators speak. John Dingell, the longest serving member of the House of Representatives in history, was gracious and statesmanlike. The others were audibly on edge, although considerably more polite and restrained in conversation with the President than they had been in their meetings with us. Congressman Sander Levin seemed to interpret the President's allusions to bankruptcy for GM and Chrysler as just a negotiating tactic. I understand that you have to refer to bankruptcy to get people to the table, he began. The President interrupted in a measured tone. I don't want you to leave with that impression. I'm telling you that because it's a real possibility. After this, a chorus of anxious voices crackled through the speaker. Senator Debbie Stabenow urged that if the President was going to send such a tough message, he ought to couple it with a strong statement of support for the auto industry. Senator Levin beseeched him not to use a broad brush in criticizing the companies and to acknowledge the progress that they had made. The President listened carefully. When he brought the conversation to a close after about 30 minutes, he asked Larry to take another look at the speech. By the following morning, we'd responded by sanding down the criticism of the companies and adding the Cash for Clunkers program to boost car sales. The next call was to Jennifer Granholm of Michigan. I'd gotten to know her as an energetic, dynamic candidate during her 2006 campaign, but Michigan was suffering the nation's highest unemployment rate, and in our more recent conversation, she'd seemed beaten down and demoralized. Now, as she listened to the president outline her, uh, his plans, her spirit seemed to fall further, and her voice barely rose above a whisper. I hope you know what you're doing, she said softly. During the final call, Ron Gettelfinger, head of the United Auto Workers, who had been defiant the previous autumn when Detroit first asked for federal help, was low-key and respectful now. This augured well for the tough decisions we knew we needed to have, uh, tough, excuse me, the tough discussions we knew we needed to have with him. When his calls were completed, the President walked out of the Oval Office and back to the small TV to learn that Tiger had hit a birdie putt on the 18th hole to win. Tiger's day may have ended, but for the task force, a night of work was just beginning. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavor of at least one of the most dramatic moments in the course of uh, almost really probably at the midpoint in the course of our project. Uh, for me, this project uh, began to emerge as a possibility the previous December, in December of 2008. As you all uh, certainly know, President Obama had been elected a month or so earlier. As you all may or may not remember, uh, right after the election, in the middle of November of 2008, the car company showed up in Washington in, a famous, in the famous Senate hearing where the three CEOs flew in in three separate planes uh, to announce that there were at least two of them, Chrysler and GM, were out of money and needed help from Congress. 
And there then ensued several weeks of chaos and commotion in Washington as Congress tried to figure out what to do. And in the end, Congress couldn't act. It was a lame duck Congress. It was the end of an eight-year presidency. Everybody was tired. Uh, so Congress never acted. And the Bush administration, uh, quite correctly in my opinion, used $17 billion of TARP money from the $700 billion bailout fund to in effect give, the, uh, give Chrysler and GM a bridge, a bridge loan uh, into the Obama administration. And so President-elect Obama in December and in early January of 2009 had to decide what to do about these companies and indeed how to address it. Um, as you all know, in our country, we don't have a tradition or a desire to be very interventionist in the industrial sector. We believe in essentially keeping government out of the industrial sector. Both parties believe that wherever possible. And so within the US government, there is no Department of the Autos. There's actually nobody who knows really anything about the autos. Um, and so when President-elect Obama ha decided or had to decide what to do about this, he concluded with uh, Tim Geithner and Larry Summers' advice that the right thing to do was to set up a separate group of people whose job would be to focus on autos. Because, of course, the country was in the middle of a terrible economic and financial crisis. Autos was an important piece of it, but it was only one piece of it. And it needed its own team uh, to focus on it. So they came to me and asked me to do it. And you all, uh, based on Hugh's introduction, may say, why me? I'm not an auto guy. Um, I'm not even an industry guy. My work in the past was mostly with media and uh, telecoms companies like Google and others. But, um, the, but the president and Tim Geithner and Larry Summers didn't see this as a job of running these two auto companies. They saw it as a job of restructuring them uh, financially and in other ways so that they could be competitive going forward. And because I had had some experience in Washington and, and certainly had some experience on Wall Street, um, they felt that I, I could, in fact, um, lead this team. We put the team together uh, almost instantaneously. We didn't have a lot of time to go through a kind of a normal recruiting process. And so we hired 14 people, mostly from Wall Street, uh, all volunteers in the sense of willing to give up their jobs and their lives and their families to come to Washington to take on what you could tell from this uh, short passage I read was an incredibly um, uh, tense and scary and really terrifying kind of project. Um, so we started work really in the middle of January or thereabouts. And uh, not knowing anything about autos, not understanding the magnitude of the problem, we essentially began as, uh, as a, uh, with a fresh look at the companies and at the industry. We met with the companies. We met with every stakeholder that we could find. Everybody actually wanted to meet with us. Everybody had ideas for what should be done about the autos and uh, was, was, in fact, eager to come in and tell us what they sh thought should be done about the autos and about bankruptcy and about all these really complicated questions. And we knew from the beginning that under the terms of the Bush loan agreements, the president was going to have to tell the country by March 30th what he intended to do by, about the auto problem. And so we were on this incredibly tight, uh, tight time frame. Um, there were two important decisions that the president and Tim Geithner and Larry Summers made right at the outset that made our job a lot easier and in retrospect were, I think, critical to the success of what we did. The first was that they did not want simply a bailout for the sake of a bailout. They didn't want to kick the can down the road. They didn't want to see government money uh, used uh, irresponsibly. And so our instructions were to approach this very much the way we would in the private sector and to look at these companies as if we were still private equity guys trying to decide if these were good investments. We all knew that there would be political considerations and other kinds of decisions that would have to be made Around, around that kind of core, but they wanted the core to be, can these companies make it? What kind of return can the government look for from its investment? Does this make sense? And the second really key decision that these guys made was the principle of, uh, that I call shared sacrifice, that we knew that in order for these companies to be viable, there, was go there were going to have to be concessions from all the stakeholders, from the unions, from the creditors, from the dealers, from the suppliers. And the principle that it was going to be shared turned out to be absolutely critical to the, to the success of this. Um, and so even though the uh, UAW had been very, very supportive of the president's election, and certainly there were traditional democratic ties to organized labor, we were told, uh, again, to treat them commercially and to uh, talk to them uh, 
about what needed to be done in order to make these companies competitive in a very uh, direct and, uh, if necessary, in a, uh, in a, tough, in a tough fashion. Um, the, two, the, the toughest decision that we had to make, which is alluded to in the passage that I just read to you, uh, was the decision about whether to save Chrysler. We always felt that GM both could be saved and had to be saved. We couldn't really imagine this country without General Motors. Uh, we couldn't really imagine uh, telling the world that General Motors was going to be allowed to liquidate. GM had lost a ton of money, actually $30 billion of cash in 2008 in the first three months of 2009. But it was a global company. It had strong operations in China and in Brazil and in places like that. And we, uh, and we came into this very much of a mindset of not whether to save GM, but how to. Now, of course, if we couldn't have made the numbers work, we would have had some tough discussions around that. But we were reasonably confident that we could do that. Chrysler was a much tougher decision. Chrysler, as you may know, was owned by Daimler for seven years. It had been kind of hollowed out. It didn't have a single company that was on Consumer Reports' most recommended list. Uh, it was only operating in North America. It really wasn't a global player at all. And we had a very lively and tense debate that you all, as part of kind of the, the, new, uh, the new media technology wave, will appreciate of whether it was really government's job to save a th number three company in an old industry that had clearly failed versus using that capital to support new industries and new kinds of companies versus the fact that if Chrysler were allowed to fail, there would have been several hundred thousand people who would have lost their jobs very, very quickly. Uh, many, some of those jobs would have come back over time, but at this point, remember in March of 2009, the economy was losing about 700, six, 700,000 jobs a month, and the notion of having another 300,000 people out of work was very unappealing, unappealing to us. But it was a very lively and a very thoughtful um, debate frankly, far more thoughtful in many ways than what I expected I would find when I got to Washington, but it was very analytically based and, and well argued. Uh, and in the end, the team came really down to a four to four uh, split, uh, with me still undecided about what to do and really torn between these two very strong sets of arguments. And finally, Larry Summers turned to me and said, okay, look, you don't have the luxury to say on the one hand and on the other hand, you gotta tell me what do you wanna do. And so I, uh, as I said to Larry, by a kind of 51-49 margin, I voted uh, to save Chrysler. But we still then had spent, then ended up spending uh, several hours with the president, um, as, as alluded to in what I just read, sort of going through with him and letting both sides make those arguments to him. And in the end, as you all know, he came down uh, on our side as well. The, um, the other tough decision that we, other tough decision we had to make was management. Um, I asked uh, Hugh, and was nice enough to pass out to those of you who are here, an article that I wrote in the Financial Times uh, after Steve Jobs took a leave of absence talking about the importance of management uh, in big companies. And these were companies that uh, had gone off a cliff financially. Um, at, at, when they showed up in Washington in November of 2008, they had really given sort of no warning that they were going to run out of money, especially GM. Um, they had many, while there were certainly problems that these companies had that were not of their own making, uh, oil prices, the credit crisis, and things like that, there were many problems that were very much of their own making. And my view, having uh, been an investor for many years, an investment banker for many years, is that when it comes to making an investment decision or deciding whether a company is a good company to buy stock in, to work for, uh, or to own, that, the, uh, that management is critical, that the horse is as important as the jockey, to use, to use an old phrase. So we, we really struggled with that and in the end um, did decide to change management at both Chrysler and GM by asking Rick Wagner to step aside, a decision that became far more controversial than I ever thought it would be um, and, far, and more than I thought it should be but I, I came to understand why. And also at Chrysler, by putting Chrysler into an alliance with Fiat, uh, which had very strong management in the form of a fellow called Sergio Marchione, who had turned Fiat around. Fiat had done very well everywhere but the United States, and so the fit between the two companies was good. They weren't, we didn't merge them, but we did put them um, into an alliance together. Uh, and then the third thing that we had to figure out was how to restructure these companies financially. 
And from the very first day that I thought about taking this job, it was clear to me that bankruptcy had to be a part of the equation. And I know this isn't a financial crowd, so I'm not going to get into the weeds of bankruptcy. If you want to chat about it during questions, I'm absolutely happy to. But to keep it at a pretty high level, we did, there was simply no way that I could see to reduce the liabilities and reduce the costs of these companies enough except by using bankruptcy law. Uh, I'll give you one little example. There are, these companies both had too many dealers, uh, kind of like mom and pops trying to compete against Walmart. But dealers are protected by state franchise laws. You can't just tell a dealer that they've lost their franchise. And the only real way to efficiently reduce the number of dealers, again, was through bankruptcy. The problem with bankruptcy was that traditionally when a company goes into bankruptcy, it could stay there for a year or more. And many companies have gone through bankruptcy successfully. But we could not find a single example of a company that had gone through bankruptcy that sold a product like a car. And what I mean by that is you've all ridden on bankrupt airlines. You get on a bankrupt airline in San Francisco or San Jose, you get off in New York, your relationship with that airline is over until the next time you fly somewhere. It doesn't really matter what happens to the airline as long as they get you there. When you buy a car, you're really establishing, on average, a seven-year relationship with the company. That's how long the average person owns a car. And you want warranty service. You want out-of-warranty service. And equally importantly, you want to be able to sell that car or trade it in after seven years and get a good price for it. And we really were scared to death that people would simply stop buying cars from a bankrupt company and then the company would just collapse. And there was no amount of government capital that could have supported a company that lost its customers. So we struggled with that. And ultimately, um, thanks to some very ingenious lawyers, developed a bankruptcy process that actually got these two companies in and out of bankruptcy in record time, 42, 42 days for Chrysler and 39 days uh, for General Motors. And that was a, a fortuitous bit of business. So both companies, by July, uh, just to keep moving the narrative forward. By July of 2009, both companies had been gone into bankruptcy and had come out of bankruptcy, reconstituted with their uh, liabilities and costs substantially reduced with new management and with, very importantly, new private sector boards of directors. Because part of the failure, particularly of General Motors, was poor corporate governance. And we wanted to put in place a board that was going to be composed of people who were there not for any set of social reasons, but purely for their skills as former CEOs and former private equity people who uh, I believe also bring an important uh, component to a board of directors. And so where are we now? We have a very, uh, as those of you who follow it uh, will know, we have a very healthy Detroit. General Motors uh, recently reported its first annual profit since 2004 and its largest annual profit since 1999. Um, Chrysler is making an operating profit, not yet net income, but an operating profit. And very importantly, the, uh, the whole set of business practices around these companies that had gotten them in trouble have been reformed. Um, the use of, of uh, what we call incentives, you know, zero financing and rebates and all that stuff to get people to buy cars has been substantially curtailed. The overflow of inventories on dealers' lots that caused a lot of those problems has been substantially um, reduced. Their cost structures have been reduced. General Motors, um, we took $8 billion a year of costs out of its North America division. You know, one of the things that people criticize these companies for is not making small cars. There was actually a good reason why they didn't make small cars. They couldn't afford to. Their cost structure was so high, and they had what, what I call negative brand equity. Their cars actually sold for less than a Japanese car on an equivalent basis. That on a $20,000 car, they couldn't make money. So they made SUVs, and they made trucks, and they made things they could make money. And now they're in a position where they can make money on small cars, and I think are beginning to, uh, to take advantage of that market. And all this is happening in an environment where car sales are still quite depressed relative to, his to history. Um, before the financial crisis, we sold 16 or 17 million cars a year in this country. And actually, GM, with its huge cost structure, barely made a profit at those levels. In 2008, they dropped below 10 million car sales. And that's, of course, when they started hemorrhaging cash. They're now up to about 12 and a half million car sales last year. So still not nearly back to where they were at the peak. But yet GM is making, as I said, the largest profit that they've made in 11 years. And that's because they now have a viable, a viable business model. I believe car sales will continue to increase. Um, you need to sell 15 million cars a year in this country simply to replace the ones that come off the road 
and to take account of new drivers. And so I think inexorably they will continue to rise, and as they do because of operating leverage, these companies um, will do very well. So I feel very good about what we did and about the decisions that the President made to intervene here. And what I'd like to do before I open this up to questions is just to give you, as I said I would at the beginning, five or six big takeaways, some of which I've already uh, alluded to or talked about. Um, the first is that this could never have happened. And I'm, look, I'm not here to give a commercial for President Obama. I was proud to work for him, but he doesn't sign my paychecks now. And I I'm, I'm try to be as honest as I can in these talks. And so I would tell you candidly, this could not have happened without the two principles that I said at the beginning um, being very firmly embedded in his decision making. The concept of shared sacrifice, which allowed us to get all the parties to do more than they had ever done before, and the concept that we're only going to put money in in the context of a viable business plan that we believed could lead to profitability for these uh, companies. And because of that, point number two is that we were able to go about this as if we were in the private sector, as if our job was to make good. We were investing all your money, all your tax dollars were the, was the money that we were, the $82 billion that we put into these companies came from the taxpayers, and we were determined to do the best job we could. And we were able to, I believe. Thirdly, I didn't talk here because of uh, uh, the nature of this group about some of the controversial aspects of our project, but one of them was the way creditors were perceived to have been treated. And again, I'm happy to get into this in the Q&A if people want to, but uh, there was a lot of controversy about how the union was treated versus the bondholders versus the banks. And what I would simply say to this group for the moment, and again, happy to get into the details of it if you all want to, was that we treated uh, these groups um, completely according to past precedent, completely legally. We had fleets of lawyers looking at everything we did. Uh, what we did was litigated heavily, as you can imagine, by people who were not happy, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. When I went to Washington, I never in a million years imagined I would, that my project, I would be worrying about a United States Supreme Court decision, but there we were um, in uh, late May of 2009, sitting in Larry Summers' office in the West Wing of the White House, waiting for the Supreme Court to pronounce whether what we had done with Chrysler was legal or not. And not a single judge from the bankruptcy court all the way to the Supreme Court uh, ever questioned or criticized or pushed back in the slightest way on anything um, that we did. Um, the fourth point which I mentioned is the importance of management. You know, the decision that we made to ask Rick Wagner to step aside was a tough decision. I like Rick. He's an honest, hardworking, smart guy who is completely dedicated to the company. But the fact was that GM did lose $30 billion in 15 months. And what was worse than that was that Rick and his team didn't have a, a re, what an, did not have what in our minds was a realistic plan for how they were going to turn it around. The plans that they gave us were kind of a, a lot of what I would call old GM. A lot of, well, car sales will recover, you know, we'll make a bunch of assumptions, oil prices will come down. And we said, no, you've got to do scenario planning that doesn't simply assume the best case, but actually assumes the worst case. And then we can talk about everything in between. And they just never really got it. And we could not simply justify putting what ultimately became $50 billion that went into General Motors um, behind that management team. And so we made a tough decision to uh, ask Rick to step aside. I think we uh, misjudged, I misjudged or underestimated the amount of public reaction there would be to that and this idea of the long arm of government reaching in and firing the head of GM. But it was the right decision to make. We might not have, I might not have communicated or handled it perfectly, but um, if I had to do it again, I would make the same recommendation. Um, the fifth point I would leave you to think about in terms of hopefully coming away from this talk feeling like you uh, learned something is the importance of TARP. TARP, as you all probably know, is the $700 billion so-called bailout fund that uh, President Obama got uh, strongly criticized for during the 2008 election, 2010 election, but which in fact was passed by President Bush in 2008 on his watch. And in my mind, and again, I'm happy to elaborate on this, TARP is probably the single most important piece of economic legislation that's been passed in this country since the Great Depression. That may be an overarching or overreaching statement, but I'll make it. Because TARP is what allowed the Bush and the Obama administrations to save the banks and to save the financial system, and it's what allowed us to save the auto industry. And without TARP, we and the Bush people would have had to go to Congress 
at every step of the way for every dollar that we wanted to put in these uh, companies. And I don't want to sound like I'm anti-democratic or don't believe in democracy, I do, but I've also now, having spent a fair amount of time in Washington, a fair amount of time with Congress, can tell you that if these decisions were left in the hands of Congress, nothing good would have come of it. Uh, we certainly would have gone over the precipice in terms of these companies running out of money and Congress having to see the disastrous consequences of that before it would have acted and by then who knows what the, whether it would have been too late or not. So again, I'm not here to suggest we abolish Congress or to sound like I'm in favor of totalitarian rule, but it was a real lesson learned for me about how much of the trouble uh, getting anything done in Washington relates to Congress rather than to the president. The president gets tagged for all the problems, but there's a bunch of people on Capitol Hill who deserve at least their share of the responsibility. Um, and the last point that I want to leave you with, which is a very broad point that was an eye-opener to me, because like all of you, I had never really worked in manufacturing uh, and been exposed to the industrial sector, is how uh, difficult a competitive challenge this is for America. You've all read about the challenges of manufacturing. I have now seen them firsthand. And they really exist first and foremost in the fact that many other countries, you know, we all think about China, but there's lots of others, have succeeded in raising their game to the level where they can compete with us in many kinds of products uh, very efficiently, very productively, but paying much, much less. And I'll give you one statistic that I got from GM that really kind of uh, was a little bit mind-boggling to me. Um, the total cost of a GM worker, including the famous benefits, but also relatively high base wages, is about $55 an hour, or at least uh, it is now. It's going to hopefully come down a little bit. In Mexico, GM, the same company, pays $7 an hour. In China, they pay $4 an hour, and in India, they pay $1 an hour. And I'm not here to tell you that the productivity in India or China is as high as it is in the U.S., but in Mexico, it actually is as high, even with wages at a small fraction. And so we face a very, very tough competitive challenge in this country with respect to manufacturing. And if you think about the Chrysler decision that I articulated, you kind of magnify it. It's a, it, it's a tough set of policy choices about whether we continue to try to save our manufacturing sector and decide how important that is and what we're willing to do to save it, uh, what, has, what the sacrifices would have to be to save it versus developing new industries like the ones that you guys are all involved with as an alternative kind of public policy. So I don't have answers to all that. You all may have your own thoughts. But I must say that it was eye-opening for me to see how challenging um, uh, a, a set of circumstances our manufacturing sector faces. So just to finish up, um, I was really uh, proud to be asked to do this uh, by the President. As I said, I think the decisions that we made, even looking back on them now, uh, almost two years since we made them, almost two years to the day since we made them, were the right decisions. And I think this was a case where the exception government intervention should only be by exception, uh, was the right exception to make, and that by a judicious use of government capital, most or all of which we will get back, we were able to save what were probably a couple of million jobs that would have been lost had GM and Chrysler and all the related companies uh, been allowed to fail. So thank you all very much for having me, and happy to hear questions or comments or criticisms. And this is actually on a, uh, on a wire, so it's not going to help much. I'll repeat okay, the question. Yeah. Yes, sir. In your last point, you mentioned the challenges of the manufacturing sector in the U.S. I'm wondering, uh, we're sitting here in broad, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on um, some of the politicians you spoke to and others in the administration, how they sort of thought about that challenge, about how strategic it was to have manufacturing in the U.S. There, uh, the question is, uh, uh, with respect to the broad issue of manufacturing, what kinds of things I heard or, or were discussed about this issue of manufacturing and how we should be thinking about it as a country. And so maybe this is implicit in your question, but the fact is it's an article of faith that we should have a strong manufacturing base. You would be burned at the stake like a witch in Salem if you were to stand up and say, who cares about manufacturing? You know, we can survive without it. You know, we got, we got Google, we got Facebook, we got Twitter, we got all these other things. We don't need manufacturing. No politician of any party would stand up and say that. So the debate really, even though you could make that argument, and in the book I talk, for example, about the fact that uh, 
I happen to know this because my family had a very small uh, part in this, but if you go back to New York City in the latter part of the 19th century and the early 20th century, New York City, by which I mean uh, Brooklyn and Queens principally, was a industrial heart of America. There were chemicals plants, there were paint factories, there were, uh, there were oil refineries, there was every kind of manufacturing you would imagine, obviously textiles and garments, all existed in New York City. And today, of course, they're all gone. And yet New York City is doing better than it's ever done. You know, this is what Schumpeter called creative destruction with new industries coming to take over for old industries. Um, you know, I remember when they tore down the last manufacturing uh, uh, company in New York, a company called Washburn Wire, and there's now a Target and a Costco there, but uh, in Manhattan, this is, uh, but Manhattan is doing great. So you could make that argument that we should transform, our, we should move uh, like we have all through history into a kind of post-manufacturing era and embrace these newer technologies, newer businesses that create jobs and let manufacturing fall where it may. But there is absolutely no political stomach to stand up and say that or advocate it as a policy. You know, having said that, I would say that one of the things I'm also pr very proud of about the Obama administration is that they have not embraced protectionism. There were a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of criticisms of the president during the election campaign, saying he was a protectionist. Um, and there's been not a whiff of protectionism. And in fact, he you know, is hopefully going to push through the South Korea Free Trade Agreement over a lot of opposition. Um, and so I think the administration has found a balance between doing things that are clearly ill-advised uh, and versus simply saying, we don't care about manufacturing, let's just let it go. And so my former deputy, Ron Bloom, who came out of, uh, who actually is a graduate of the Harvard Business School and worked at Lazard with me for a brief time, is still in the administration as the head, kind of the special advisor on manufacturing, and he's trying to come up with ways to encourage manufacturing. And there probably are some things that we can do that are economically sensible. Um, Germany, for example, where I just spent last week for precisely this reason, is very successful at manufacturing right now because, as one of the Germans said to me, we make the thing that goes inside that goes inside the thing. In other words, they make these little things that nobody pays much attention to but that involve fairly precision work where um, Chinese and other emerging markets are not yet interested in competing and Germany has a huge export surplus from manufacturing. But, and so I think we, there are things we can do to encourage sensible kinds of manufacturing businesses, but I think we have to be really careful not to, um, not to be too much of a twig in the stream, not to try to redirect the flow of water too much from its natural course, and to some degree accept the fact that over time our economy is going to evolve and certain kinds of jobs are simply going to go away, and hopefully we're going to find other jobs to replace them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, yes, sir, next. Uh, you seem to argue formulate a very strong response or defense of TARP, and I think that was in the context more or less of the auto industry, but it seems like it's a much more pernicious uh, concept in the finance industry, like more hazard. And just, you know, it's, it's setting a precedent. What, what do you think, what are your thoughts about how the fact that TARP now as a concept exists in our mindset, and how that influences how executives of like large financial firms, uh, and even, even large auto firms, or any firm, right, knows in the back of the mind that as long as the government's capable of printing money, there might be a backstop. That's a good question. So the question is about TARP and the fact that I argued strenuously in favor of it. And uh, if I can summarize your question, do I fully appreciate the moral hazard aspects of this and the idea that if uh, financial executives or auto executives um, uh, uh, think that there's some you know, pool of money out there that's going to bail them out, that they'll behave irresponsibly? Um, I will, I'll start with a slightly, I thought it was amusing, maybe it won't be funny to you, anecdote, which is that I, I did this talk yesterday up at Stanford Business School, and uh, right about this point in the Q&A, like the second question, uh, a guy who turned out to be a tenured professor of corporate finance very loudly interrupted and essentially made the argument to me that the management of GM had knowingly uh, spent $30 billion to run out of money simply so the government would come and bail them out. And nothing I could say, and, and there's actually one of my former auto colleagues who's at Stanford Business School in the audience, kind of backed me up, nothing I could say would convince him otherwise. It was ridiculous. You think Rick Wagner did not want the company to go bankrupt or run out of money. Um, look, I understand that point, but the fact is that we do have institutions in this country, and we always will, that are too big to fail. And I talked about this a little bit yesterday. 
you can talk, you can keep breaking the banks down into smaller and smaller units, but I don't think you're ever going to break them down to small enough units, still have an efficient banking system, and not have the risk that you could have systemic failure and have to deal with it. Hopefully, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I understand the moral hazard thing. I was certainly among a very large majority of people on Wall Street in September of 08 who said, let Lehman Brothers fail. Remember, the government had bailed out Bear Stearns. Lehman was next. Everybody said, let Lehman go. Moral hazard. Can't be bailing us all out. TARP didn't exist at that moment. So the government let Lehman go, which may have been the correct decision, and all hell broke loose. And then they had to pass TARP. Then they had to bail out AIG. And it went on from there. I would honestly tell you, I spent 26 years on Wall Street. Nobody on Wall Street went about their business before or after TARP saying, it doesn't really matter what I do because there'll be TARP out there to bail me out. TARP may have bailed out some of these institutions, but, there were, but the executives who got them in trouble you know, lost their jobs in many cases, lost their bonuses. Their stock was much diminished from what it would have been worth had the companies been successful. And I, I certainly get the fact that Wall Street compensation was a little bit, not a little bit, but was skewed in a way where it was too much heads, the individual wins, tails, the bank loses, and things like that, which have been changed. But I don't believe that people who come to work on Wall Street come there thinking, well, if I mess up, TARP will be there to bail me out. So TARP is gone now. It was shut down um, last fall because there was such popular, huge outcry about it. And I'm fine with that. I don't think it has to be there all the time. But I do think we have to recognize that in this crisis, with these set of facts being what they were, without TARP, our whole financial system would have melted down. We would have been, you know, we would have been some third world banana republic without a real banking system because there would have been no way to, to shore up these institutions. So I don't like it any better than you do, but unfortunately, I think it was necessary. Yes, sir, behind. Uh, prior to the crisis, Rick Wagoner had been, I think, making some strenuous efforts to lower their cost structure. He got the UAW to take over the health department. Um, so the question is, uh, Rick Wagner did some things, a number of things, to lower GM's cost structure and to get the UAW, uh, before the bankruptcy, and to get the UAW to take responsibility for its uh, retiree health care costs and what credit do I assign to him. Look, I, I would give him credit for that. And uh, there was a review, uh, a generally nice review of my book in The New Yorker, which then sort of went out by Malcolm Gladwell, then, then sort of went off on this riff about how Rick Wagner had actually saved GM, and we were just a bunch of private equity guys who fiddled around with the balance sheet, but he really got the credit for the things that he had done. And look, I think, uh, I think probably my short summary didn't do Rick justice during this little talk, and I think Malcolm Gladwell was too far in the other extreme, and the truth is somewhere in between. The fact was, one of the things that surprised me when I got to GM and did our diligence was that, in, in fact, as you implied in your question, from a manufacturing standpoint, GM and Chrysler are actually just about as efficient as the Japanese companies that assemble in the South. The number of man hours per vehicle, things like that, are very competitive. If you look at quality control as based on um, complaints to NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, GM, I don't remember the year, but a few years, you know, maybe five or ten years ago, had six times as many complaints per car as the Japanese companies, and now it's down to parity, roughly. So the quality is up, the efficiency is up. You're absolutely, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, yeah, efficiency is up. You're absolutely right that progress had, was made with the UAW in terms of putting a box around the health care benefits, and I think Rick and his team do deserve credit for that. But I don't think at the end of the day it was sufficient to warrant him staying against $30 billion lost, against uh, testimony that he gave, and I wouldn't, this isn't, you know, I'm not trying to conduct a trial here, but when Rick testified in, in November of 2008 in front of Congress when they flew in the three separate planes, he had, there's a paragraph which I quote in the book in which he said, these problems are not problems of our making. These are the fault of the UAW, oil prices, the Japanese yen exchange rate, and the credit crisis. And I just don't buy that. And my, and my my best argument, I think, for why I don't buy that is look at Ford. Ford was facing exactly those same four challenges. They had the same UAW contract, the same oil prices, the same credit crisis, and whatever the fourth one was, the same yen exchange rate. And yet Ford got through this crisis and last year made a lot more money than GM made. And why? Well, two reasons. One, they had the foresight to borrow $23 billion at the peak of the bubble as sort of rainy day money, and GM was frankly 
too arrogant to do that. They kind of didn't see the problem coming. And the second was because Bill Ford, name is on the door, made a decision in 2006 that he wasn't the right guy to be CEO, and he went out and hired Alan Mulally from Boeing and said, you come and be CEO. And, Rick, and uh, Bill Ford gave a speech about that time in which he said, we are an insular company in an insular industry in an insular town, by which he meant there wasn't enough talent in Detroit to really address the problems of these companies. And so, as I said, I think on balance, uh, Rick has a lot of positive attributes. But if you don't have a business plan that an investor would look at and say, I get it, this is something I'm willing to put my money behind, then you don't have, you don't have the right management team. And so I felt we did have to make a change, and I feel like it was the right decision. Yes, sir. Do I think what? The public trial of Toyota? Yes. Oh. Um, the question is whether I think the public trial of Toyota was the right thing to do, and by which um, the gentleman was referring to the, um, the, uh, the, you know, the accelerator problem and bringing the CEO in front of Congress and all that stuff. Look, I, I would say two things about it. The first thing, you know, in the, in the world of conspiracy theories, there are people out there who think that the government did this to help GM and Chrysler. And that is ridiculous. Um, I'm not saying you said that. I'm just saying some people say that. That's ridiculous. Uh, whatever happened with Toyota was between Toyota and the Department of Transportation and nothing to do with GM and Chrysler. No, I don't think necessarily bringing the CEO and, and torturing him in front of Congress was the right thing to do. But frankly, there are a lot of things that happen in Washington that are not the right thing to do. Um, when I, I was trying to recruit a new chairman of GM in March of 2009, when um, Congress brought in front of it the chairman of AIG, a guy who had left Allstate to work for a dollar a year, a very good guy called Ed Liddy, to help AIG through these problems that he had had absolutely nothing to do with. And they raked this guy over the coals about a bunch of bonus stuff that the guy had had nothing to do with. And everybody I called after that to say, would you like to come help with GM said, are you out of your mind? I wouldn't get involved with anything that has to do with Washington. And so there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in Washington, and a lot of the anti-business rhetoric that existed in Washington, which a lot of which came from Capitol Hill, was also ill-advised. So no, I don't think they should have publicly humiliated the guy. I think there was a problem with Toyota. They should have dealt with it in an appropriately level-headed way. And I think a lot of the um, emotion was unnecessary. But it's not, it's, you know, there are many, many examples of that in Washington, unfortunately. I'm sorry? Yeah, there was nothing wrong. Yeah, look, I'm not an expert. Uh, uh, the, the investigation showed there was nothing wrong. I'm not an expert on the, you know, on the mechanics of, of the whole thing. But I, you know, the, whether it was or wasn't right or wrong, it should have been handled a little bit differently by Congress. Yes, sir? On the things that you question, question. Um, there's a trade New York has caused problems for you. Would that have happened if you hadn't gone to Washington, and does that affect things? Um, the question is, the Attorney General of New York has caused some, caused some trouble for me, and would that have happened if I hadn't gone to Washington? You know, my good friend Mayor Bloomberg, who I worked for before and now, said to me, you should never look back on things. You should make a decision or deal with an issue and kind of move on. And so I think I would drive myself crazy if I sat down and tried to figure out whether it would have been different had I not been there. I think certainly having a higher profile and being visible played some role in it. But, you know, people often say to me, and I think embedded in it, is your point is, if I had to do this all over again, would I go and take this job again, knowing everything I know, with everything that's happened, good and bad to me? And the answer is, yeah, because I feel that uh, I feel government service is a great thing and something you know, everyone who's of that frame of mind should do. And in our case, we were lucky enough that we had a crisis that we could actually make a difference on. We had TARP, for better or for worse. We had a huge problem, and everybody got that it was a huge problem, and that they had to come to the table and solve it. And I don't think I'm the only one who should get any credit for it, but I think because of our team of 14 people and the president, we were able to not only save this industry, but to save it and put it into a profit-making, competitive uh, form. So you know, for all the pain and suffering of which that's only one piece of what you go through when you go to Washington, you have all your finances exposed, you get criticized all the time for everything by everybody. It's very painful to be in Washington. Um, I'm really proud of what we did, and I would do it again, even knowing everything I know now about how life has unfolded. Yes, sir. When you communicate with 
Why did I? If you have elections, count was a very negative issue for yeah. The question is, you know, TARP is a very, uh, why, why was TARP such a controversial issue in the election and why didn't we communicate it better with the voters? You know, if the problem that the president had, and it has to do with both TARP and the whole economy, is you're trying to prove a counterfactual. You, you, you can't, and I'm not sure I've convinced any of you, you, it's very hard to convince people that TARP, for example, was a great thing when you can't demonstrate to them, you're all, I'm sure, fact-based, evidence-based people, that you can't convincingly tell them what would have happened if we hadn't done it. The same is true of the stimulus program. I believe the stimulus program, the $875 billion or so that was passed in early 2009, played a very material role in bringing the economy at least as far out of the recession as it's come. But you can't convince anybody in the public of that because you can't say to them, well, if we hadn't had it, this is what would have happened. I completely believe that without TARP, as I said, the financial industry would have collapsed and if Congress had let it go this far, the auto industry would have collapsed. But I'm not sure I've even convinced you guys, let alone convince the country. And so it's just very hard to prove a counterfactual, and I think that was the president's challenge in the midterm election. And of course, look, he was running up against terrible unemployment and you know, very negative feelings about the economy, none of which helped. But it's a very hard argument to make. I'll give you one little amusing little nugget. There were seven Congress people who ran for uh, re-election in 2010, and part of their platform was that they voted against TARP except that they were first-term Congress people who hadn't been in office back in 2008 when TARP was actually approved. But they still felt they could run for re-election against it, so, as, as having voted against it. So it's a, you know, it's, a, look, it's a very emotional kind of world out there, and politics, unfortunately, is not always as rational as business or other parts of the world. Maybe last question. Last question. Uh, so, it's not fairly summarizing, but I mean, it seems like you said that people who are the head of these companies are generally well intentioned. Um, and that we're never going to get rid of the too big to economy. And that government intercession should be a very limited and rare sort of special case. So is there anything that can sort of be done to stop this sort of thing from happening? Or is it just sort of the price we pay for this sort of economy that we have to pay in massive failures and just step in and best we can? Um, that's a great question. The question is, so I argue that basically we're never going to get away from too big to fail. There's no way to break these companies or firms down to sizes that will make them not systemic. There's no way to necessarily prevent Wall Street people or executives or anybody from making, doing irresponsible things or making mistakes. And do we have to live with the concept that we're going to periodically have these huge kinds of financial crises or other problems that we have to deal with? Um, I think the short answer, if you want like a yes or no answer, is probably yes, uh, that we're going to have uh, problems from time to time. That's certainly been the history. This happened to be a really, really bad one, you know, the worst one since the Depression, obviously. I think we've learned a lot of things. We've passed a bunch of laws, like Dodd-Frank, that are, you know, well-intentioned and in some cases positive and constructive. Other parts of the bills are negative and not helpful. But we've made a lot of changes, and I think for a good long, and, and I think people's behavior changes, because they have seen what happens. And as I said earlier, whether you guys all agree with me or not, I don't think anybody on Wall Street thought this was a lot of fun, with or without TARP. And so I think you have seen a lot of behavior changes. We have new international rules about banking reserves and all kinds of stuff that are designed to keep this from happening again. And so I think we're in reasonably good shape for a reasonable period of time that this won't happen again. But I think it is, I think the fact of a free market economy that you have to accept is that there are going to be cycles and there are going to be things that occur when uh, excesses build up in a system and people aren't really uh, paying attention. But part of why we had this problem was because in the late 90s and early 2000s under both Republicans and Democrats, we made a decision to deregulate the financial sector heavily. Our, the argument was it could compete better if it was deregulated. Well, obviously we went too far and now it's been dialed back. So look, I think it's just a constant process of improvement and trying to do it a little bit better and not make the same mistakes twice, but I don't really see an alternative to the system we have except, as I said, trying to do it better. So thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate your interest and your hospitality.